29 is a global network of over 700 churches worshiping in 50 countries with nearly 30 languages. And we are committed to planting healthy, multiplying churches in every corner of the world. God is a global God and that he works through different ethnicities and cultures and languages around the world. Being faithful to God's great commission is to make disciples and to plant churches. Churches characterized by theological clarity, cultural engagement, and missional innovation. We believe that uh, the church is God's primary mission strategy for establishing His kingdom and His presence on earth. We want to reach people with the gospel, and our reach is amplified through Acts 29 as a network, so more people will know and worship each one of our members has been blessed by all the training that we have received as planters. We want our church to be a praying church and also a church that disciples others. This is what we do and this is who we are. We are people who plant churches. So Acts 29 accomplishes its mission uh, primarily through three things. By assessing potential church planters. We provide continued assistance for churches and leaders through coaching, trainings, and also relational connection. We get to collaborate with the whole Bride of Christ to plant churches, not only just in our areas, but we partner globally to plant churches. And as we partner together with Acts 29, with churches around the world, our efforts are multiplied and the God is glorified when we work together as a church. This is Acts 29. 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 All right, hey guys, uh, Pastor Jim here. Uh, we're gonna be in Acts chapter nine, jumping out of our, our study in the Gospel of Luke uh, for uh, a, a moment. This is a special week for us. And uh, for you, I wanna invite you, I wanna uh, inspire you even uh, to be a part of something bigger than you. And so uh, let, let's let's jump in and, and see what the Lord would have for our time together. From, from the start, we, we wanted this thing, this church, uh, to be more than just a religious event that we hold on a Sunday. Uh, that's not why we started this church in my living room 10 years ago. Uh, we, we wanted to saturate a city. We wanted to saturate Fort Worth with the glory and grace of Jesus. And, and, and by saturate, we, what we meant was all of Fort Worth, right? Every color and culture and community would be swimming in the ocean deep grace of God. And our strategy to do that was pretty simple. We were going to we were going to preach the gospel, plant churches and push back darkness. And today we get to celebrate one aspect of those. In fact, I would argue all of them work together, but uh and that's the planting of another church, Redemption Hill, uh, sending out Pastor Brad uh to uh the uh, South Fort Worth. Uh and so when we talk about planting churches, what what we mean is is this. That that somebody started a city group, so this these groups, this 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 you know group of people meeting in a home throughout the week, uh, in a particular neighborhood. They went and told their friends and talked to their neighbors and, and and told them about Jesus and and we baptized people and we made disciples and and we multiplied some groups and then eventually in a particular area of the city there was enough groups to where we said let's plant a church. There, that's happened in West Fort Worth with Pastor Ryan. That happened in uh, the the east east side with uh, Canaan and Eric. It happened in uh, North Fort Worth with Jake, and now it's happening in South Fort Worth with Pastor Brad as well. And I want to invite you to be a part of this, uh, to be a part of all that Jesus is doing in His church, and to take whatever next step uh, that 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 should be for you to follow Him. Okay, and, and I know some of you are like, I don't know if I follow him. Cool. So that that's the next step is that you'd become a Christian. So we're going to spend the majority of our time here in verse thirty-one of Acts Acts nine. But I want to I want to read the story to you first uh, because it's a fascinating, it's an interesting story. It's the conversion of the apostle Paul. So listen to this, verse one. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, that's, that's, that's Christians, 
men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He wants to arrest the Christians. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter enter the city, and you'll be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days, he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. That's a dramatic conversion story. Yes. Let's keep going. Verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Uh, it's interesting that the or early church, they were all charismatic. They all had visions and dreams and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I, I just love that. Verse 13, but Ananias answered, Lord, I have uh, heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. He's like, God, I don't know about this. And here uh, he, he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go. For he is my chosen, he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and he was baptized and then taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this man who, uh, who made havoc in Jerusalem? I thought you couldn't make havoc. You had to wreak havoc, but he made havoc. Uh, of all those who call upon his name. And and has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night, led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. When he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the disciples and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, uh, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord, and he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. Everybody's trying to kill Saul. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea. Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So you have this dramatic conversion story of the apostle Paul, and and he'll go on to become the the the, the most prolific church planter and missionary that the Christian church has ever known. He'll he'll write over half of the New Testament. Uh, Saul was his Hebrew name. He becomes uh, he doesn't become Paul. Paul is just his Greek name. And, and he wasn't uh, just indifferent to Christianity when Jesus met him and saved him. He was an enemy to the church. Some of you that are watching, you're indifferent to Jesus. You're indifferent to the Bible for the most part. That wasn't Saul. That wasn't Paul at all. Uh, he, 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 uh, it wasn't that, uh, you know, he just didn't see a need for Jesus like some of us can maybe have, or we, we don't see the point of Christianity. He was an, uh, an enemy of the church. Paul was on the opposing side of the church. He was persecuting the church, going from city to city and arresting Christians. It said he was breathing threats and murder against the disciples. Uh, there's a judge in Iran right now uh, uh, called, uh, uh, his name is Mohammed Mogish, but he's known as the judge of death. Uh, he hates Christians. 
In, in October of last year, he sentenced four men to 10 years in prison and a bunch of money because they had started a church in their home. They had started a city group in their home. Uh, This judge, he's a devout Muslim. He even went to seminary. He's officially ordained. That was the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul sat under the best rabbi, went to the best seminary. He was zealous in his faith, and he was going from town to town arresting people in the church. And and notice in verse 4 again, Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? Paul wasn't persecuting Jesus. Jesus was ascended and at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Uh, he was persecuting the church. But Jesus says, no, 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 you're persecuting me. That's my body. That's my bride. When you mess with my bride, that's like messing with me. Uh, you know, not anymore. You're, you're done with that. Uh, I, I, I couldn't possibly overstate this enough. Uh, how tied, how bound Jesus is to his church. There, there's... There's no way you can say you like Jesus, but not the church. That's like saying, Jim, I like you, but not your bride, not your wife. You can't do that. We're one. We're united. Uh, Jesus is fierce for his church. Jesus died for the church. Uh, In Acts 20, it's an encouragement to pastors to care for the church because Jesus died for her. Jesus uh, bought her with his own blood. In uh, Ephesians 5, marriage is this big deal and husbands are to love their wives in this sacrificial way of love because Jesus loved his bride, the church, and gave himself up for her. You, You don't get Jesus without the church. He loves his church. And so Paul is persecuting the church, and Jesus says, no, you're actually persecuting me. I'm not going to play that anymore. Saves him, stops it, and calls Paul to the mission of the church. It's awesome. And so let me just point out two realities here, and then we'll we'll move on, because I want to spend the majority of our time in verse 31. Uh, but, But two quick things, two quick observations. One, Jesus can save anyone at any time, anywhere. Jesus can save anyone at any time, anywhere. Like Paul wasn't indifferent to Jesus at all. He just didn't want anything to do with him. Uh, He didn't want to be saved. He wasn't looking for Jesus. He wasn't, you know, uh, uh, he hadn't hit rock bottom. There wasn't a tragedy in his life. He wasn't asking spiritual questions. It was none of that. It was none of that. He just straight up hated the church. And yet Jesus saved him, right? Nothing happened except that Jesus showed up. Paul wasn't invited to an Easter service. He wasn't, there's none of that. Like Jesus just showed up. And so listen, I, like, I don't know where you're at. Uh, maybe you, you're a Christian, you love Jesus and, and you're praying for friends and coworkers and family members. Uh, you want them to become a Christian. You want them to meet Jesus. Um, be encouraged. All it takes is just for Jesus to show up. Keep praying, keep inviting, keep having those kinds of conversations. Uh, nobody is too far gone. Jonah 2 says, salvation is of the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. It is God who saves. Uh, But then I know that some of you are watching and you're you're not really sure where you are on your spiritual journey or where you are in in relationship with God or what you believe uh, exactly. And, And maybe you feel like you've done too much wrong. Maybe you feel like you're too far gone. Maybe you feel like uh, your past has paralyzed you from being able to progress into the future in any sort of way spiritually. And, and Paul's story should give you great hope that none of us, in fact, deserve salvation. The message of Jesus is that none of us is good enough or religious enough or moral enough or awesome enough or successful enough uh, uh, when it comes to our relationship with God. Man, that might help you with your relationship with others, but with God, it doesn't. The cross of Christ says, you can't do this, but I got this, right? That's the whole message of the gospel is Jesus saying, you can't, but I can, and I will for you, okay? So Jesus can save anyone at any time, anywhere. Second thing, verse 16 says, for I will show him, Paul, how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Here's the second thing. You will still suffer. It will still be hard. Following Jesus doesn't mean the end of your problems. 
Man, like if you, like after this sermon, after this time, you jump on mission with us, you get connected in some sort of way, you, 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 you lead a group or you, you serve with the net in the city or you jump on a team or you plan a church with us. Like whatever, whatever happens from this moment on, I can promise you there will still be suffering. There'll still be suffering. But in the midst of suffering is Jesus. You'll get more of him that in, in that place of suffering, right? He's there with you in the suffering. We have found over and over and over that Jesus is enough despite our problems, despite what we go through. And, and there's going to be persecution. We're seeing that all throughout the church in the Middle East. The church is blowing up in the Middle East, but there's all sorts of persecution. And there's the kind of persecution in the States right now that is very similar to the persecution of the church, the early church in Asia Minor. In the in in uh, you can read about it in First Peter, but the the persecution they were facing was one of words. It was mocking and belittling. It was being treated as lower class citizens. That's the kind of persecution that's growing ever more in the states as well. Following Jesus doesn't mean the end of your problems, but those two truths should resonate with us. That we as a as a church have sent people sent to proclaim and display the glory of great and grace of God to a people, the people around us in desperate need of glory and grace, that sometimes it will feel like life, but sometimes it will feel like death. That Jesus can and will save anyone, and you can and will be persecuted. We will suffer, but Jesus is enough. Right? Jesus is enough, okay? But verse 31, that, that's the place where I want to camp out with you. It says this, this whole section, after Paul gets saved, says this, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up, right? They're being strengthened and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Right, so despite the suffering, despite the persecution, the church multiplied. The growth of the church, it doesn't come from great children's ministries or great preaching or, or you know, great live stream ministry or dynamic worship. No, it's fear plus comfort equals the multiplication of the church. And so first, the fear of the Lord. What does that mean? And this idea is all throughout the scriptures. In the Proverbs, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, Solomon, who also wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, which, by the way, is a great book for, uh, you know, just young, millennial, angsty folks like us, okay? Uh, I, I know that's not all of you, but, but many of us. Ecclesiastes is a great book, but it, the, the book ends with Solomon saying, the, the end of the matter is this. All that you need to know is this, fear God and keep his commandments. Um, uh, so the fear of God is all throughout the scriptures. What does it mean? Michael Reeves, he writes at the beginning of his book, Rejoice and Tremble. He says, I want you to rejoice in this strange paradox that the gospel both frees us from fear and gives us fear. It frees us from our crippling fears, giving us instead a most delightful, happy, and wonderful fear. All right, the fear of God is wonderful. It is like standing on a cliff overlooking the ocean at the sunset. Uh, it is uh, uh, beautiful and magisterial. It's huge, right? It's like, it's so wholly beyond you. It, it's outside of you. It's bigger than you. And in that moment, you're not stressed out about work, right? That, that's, that's impossible. You're on a cliff overlooking the ocean uh, uh, at sunset. It's too big. It's too beautiful. You're not thinking about work. In that moment, you aren't worried about what people think of you. In fact, in that moment, you're not thinking about it yourself at all. You're in a completely self-forgetful place, which, by the way, is the most freeing place to be in. That is the place of freedom, this completely self-forgetful place, because the only thing that matters is how big and beautiful this thing is that you are, you're taking in, like you're outside of yourself. You just want to taste it. You just want to see it. You just want to be a part of it in some sort of way. And you don't want to fall in. Right? That's the fear of the Lord. Uh, the fear of the Lord is, is, is us joining in with Moses, where we have to take off our shoes because we stand on holy ground. The fear of the Lord is where we tremble with the disciples, uh, uh, where, 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 where we're in more fear of Jesus than we are of the storm because we see that Jesus has power over the storm. 
It's where we resonate with the writer of Hebrews who says that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Right? Simply the fear of the Lord is the very thing that you were made for. Uh, to be fully alive in the presence of a huge, big, beautiful, and gracious God, while at the same time completely unashamed and fully self-forgetful, uh, where you, you realize your vulnerability, you realize your limitations because you're in the presence of such greatness, but there's no insecurities or anxieties at all. That's the fear of God. That's the fear of God. Okay, so there's this bigness to God. There's this fear of God, but then there's also the nearness of God as well that the church walks in, right? The fear of God and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, right? That's what every church needs in order to multiply. And so the second thing we need to talk about is the comfort of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Uh, the Holy Spirit is God, all right? The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. You've got the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in the, the Christian God. And uh, I don't have time to get into it. It's a mystery. Uh, it's hard to understand and conceive of, but I'm actually okay with it. I'm okay with having a God that's hard for me to grasp. I feel like if I could fully understand God, then maybe he wouldn't be God. Maybe I would be God. If I could understand him, then maybe I'm the God. I, I want to make sure that my God is bigger than me and I can't quite understand him. Okay? So it's the Holy Spirit who brings this comfort, the third person of the Trinity. Um, and so when Jesus was walking with his disciples during his three-year earthly ministry, he would tell them that they could do, they were going to be able to do greater things than even he was doing because when he left, he would send them this Holy Spirit. And so after his death and resurrection and then his ascension into heaven, he sends the Spirit in Acts chapter 2. We're in Acts chapter 9. But in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit is sent to the church, the fire of the church is lit, and the rest is now history. But without the Spirit, the church is nothing. Like you can have great children's ministry, you can have great preaching, you can have great all those things, but without the Spirit, the church will do nothing. It's the Holy Spirit that opens your eyes to the truth of Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit that dwells with you, that's God with you. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts you of sin. It's the Holy Spirit that unites you to Jesus and even unites us to one another as the church. It's the Holy Spirit that empowers us and guides us and comforts us on the mission of God that we've been called to. In fact, the word comfort here, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it's the same Greek word that Jesus is using in John chapter 14 and 15 and 16 when he talks about the Holy Spirit coming. It's the, the word paraclete. And it's translated, depending on, on which Bible translation you use, any number of ways. Comforter or advocate or counselor uh, uh, or 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 uh, the the helper, and it's a the reason why it's translated in so many different ways is because it means all of those things. It's a combination of two Greek words, para to 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 come alongside, to walk alongside, to even be more specific, and kaleo to call, or to testify, or to preach, or to to counsel, to speak to. So the Holy Spirit is God coming alongside of you and speaking to you, comforting you encouraging you, teaching you, leading you. That's what the paraclete is. That's what the Holy Spirit is. And in John chapter 14 and 15 and 16, Jesus tells us what the Holy Spirit would do as he came alongside and, and talked to us. It's, he said that he would testify to us, that he would guide us in truth, and that he would teach us. Basically, he's everything that you would need. Everything you would need to do this life, the, 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 this mission, to do this work, to, 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 to be in the kingdom of God and to usher people into the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit is everything that you would need. I tell folks this all the time. I told a gal this a couple of Sundays ago, um, where sometimes when folks are like graduating from school and moving away from our city and our church, or they uh, their job transfers them or they move away for whatever reason, and uh, uh, you know maybe the Lord had done something special in their time with us. They got saved here. They got baptized here. They they just uh, you know grew closer to God in their time with us. And there's a little bit of uh, angst, a little bit of uh, uh, worry in them sometimes about where they're going, this new community, this new church, and, and will it be the same there? And I'll tell them all the time, it's the Spirit that did that work. 
It's the Spirit who did that work, and it's the same Spirit that will go with you wherever you go. It's the Spirit who is the comforter. It's the Spirit who is the helper. It is the Spirit of God who is the primary discipler of the follower of Jesus, okay? Now, that's only true for the Christian. That's only true for the person that is trusted in Jesus, who confesses Jesus as Lord. Otherwise, if that's not you, you don't have the presence of God. You don't have the comfort of his spirit. You don't have the fear of the Lord. You just have all your other fears, your fears and anxieties and stresses and your sin. Uh, but if you do have the spirit, you have everything you need, right? So trust in Jesus, receive the spirit, have everything that you would need. Um, but listen to all that the spirit does. In Romans 8, the spirit, uh, he says, you have no longer have a spirit of fear, but a spirit of sonship. And the Holy Spirit is the one who testifies to your spirit that you're a child of God. 2 Timothy 1 says, we've not been given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, right? Uh, in fact, we have all the power that we need. Acts 1.8, Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Are you comforted to know that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is now at work in you? Uh, the Spirit makes us bold, Acts 4. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. They were filled with the Spirit and continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. Are you comforted to know that when you feel nervous, maybe when you feel cowardly, to share the gospel, to share the good news of Jesus with somebody, that it's the Spirit who will give you boldness in that moment? Uh, it's the spirit that gives us wisdom, Acts 6.10. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit in with, in, uh, with which uh, uh, the disciples were speaking. Are you comforted to know that the spirit will give you insight and understanding? The spirit will also lead us and send us to people. He's guiding us to, to the people that we should share the gospel with. Acts 8.29, and the spirit said to Philip, go over, join this chariot, All right, roll up on that car and give him some Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit that is doing all of that kind of work. Right? The Spirit gives us passion in our mission, stops us from going somewhere sometimes. Acts 16 fills us with faith. Acts 11 fills us with joy. Acts 13 sends out church planners. Acts 13, I could go on and on and on, but it is the Spirit who comforts us. It's the Spirit of God who leads us and does that work. Now, Notice it doesn't say, notice I didn't say that the Spirit comforts us by taking us out of uncomfortable situations. That's not how it works. Uh, the Spirit doesn't comfort us by changing our circumstances uh, at all. Uh, in fact, the Spirit often will lead us into uncomfortable circumstances so that He would be our comfort in the midst of it. He is our comfort, not that He makes us comfortable. The Spirit isn't somebody that brings you a blanket. He's the blanket. The Spirit isn't someone who brings you water when you're thirsty. He's the water. God, you're in the, you're in the presence of God. God is leading you, guiding you. He is your comfort in the midst of all of it. And so in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the church multiplied. It multiplied. All of this is not an end uh, in and of itself. The result of all of this work is that the church multiplies. The, the church was never designed to just be this safe place that you would, you would go to every once in a while or watch every once in a while. Uh, and, and, you know, so that you could raise your kids in a, in, you know, with good morals or something like that. That's not what it was about. You don't need the spirit for that. You, there's no fear of God in that. Uh, in fact, it kind of sounds boring. Uh, I would only go once a month. I would only watch once a month. Uh, I would never plug in if that's what church was. That doesn't inspire me at all, and that probably wouldn't inspire you. But Charles Spurgeon, he said, the Christian church was designed from the first to be aggressive, to be aggressive. Jesus said that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Uh, the comfort of the Spirit and the fear of God, it, 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 the picture you should have is like being in the eye of a hurricane or being like a, a kite caught up in the wind, like we're doing something here. Uh, there's stuff happening and this is, it's scary, but it's awesome and we're, we, we, we're, we're, we're doing something, right? Or at least we're supposed to. That's what the church is, it's meant to be aggressive, we're meant to be doing something. 
And we're talking about gospel ministry and mission here. We're talking about the power of God to save sinners for his glory through the ministry of the church as she is displayed in all of her wonder as this broken yet redeemed people like this collision of glory and grace in the souls of men, this inbreaking of divine love on the canvas of hard hearts, this terrible mercy that, that puts back together all that is broken and we get to be invited into that. That's what we are about. That's what the church is called to be about because that's what Jesus is doing and Jesus and his church are united. That's what we're inviting you into. It is the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit that took 40 people in my living room 10 years ago and multiplied it into four churches that had 2,000 people attend all of our Easter services a couple of weeks ago. And instead of that one group in my living room, now we have 60 groups meeting across the city, across our five total churches. And instead of one neighborhood represented, we have now we now have groups in virtually every neighborhood in Fort Worth. Literally, we are saturating Fort Worth with the glory and grace of God, with the fear of God and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Y'all are actually doing this thing that we have set out to do. And now we get to send out our fourth church plant, the fifth church in our Paradox family of churches as we, as we send out Pastor Brad to plant Redemption Hill in South Fort Worth. Uh, we're commissioning Pastor Brad and 50 people to start this new work, to multiply and to keep this thing going that Jesus started 2,000 years ago with 12 knuckleheads. Right, 12 knuckleheads Jesus took and boom, it's become what it has become. Like there is no reason There is nothing about us. There's nothing about me. There's nothing about Brad that makes makes any of this make sense. Only Jesus. Only Jesus could do this. Only the work of the Spirit could do what, what we are doing, you and I, as a church right now. And so I want you to watch this video. I want you to watch this story, and then I'll come back and, and finish up. There's, a, there's one more thing I need to chat with you about. But as you watch it, I want you to consider what God is calling you to next. What's next for you? What's the next step in, in, your, in, your, uh, uh, in your jumping on into the mission of God? What's your next step to be a part of the movement of God? Okay, but watch this video. Watch this story. So the other night, I started gathering all the addresses of people on the launch team. Yeah. And if forward is this, you know, we're here. Yeah, that's awesome. It's really cool to see that localized yeah. mission yeah. just totally focused on just that, that area. Right. I could never have imagined a situation where the Lord would call us away from the Paradox Church. There's this comfort that goes with staying at the Paradox and wanting to be at the Paradox until we die. And we kind of, you know, thought that's where we'd be. But being and going, we know that's what God's calling us to. So do you remember our first Sunday here? I do, man. I'll never forget it. I had just zero idea of what to expect. Yeah. People showed up, surprise one. No, I know, we weren't sure. One thing I remember is just how bootleg everything was. Like we had a torn screen that the Rooted had given us, a wobbly stage that City View had given us. We had a bootleg sound system that Kevin Groff brought us his like PA system. Praise be to God they did, but it wasn't that good. And I just remember, I remember just people singing, you know, and like people genuinely being excited about what, what God was doing and... We've always been a singing church. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you started that. That's right. Yeah. Jesus started that. We were at the village in Dallas right. and we saw your promo video and you had the dorkiest video. It was so funny. <laughs> and we both looked at each other like, we have to go to this church. Like, <laughs> this is the church we need to be at. Matt and I were just a part of so many different churches that we didn't really plug in until we got to the Paradox. It was the first kind of like communal experience with other adults that you're really talking about like deep things and it's just really eye-opening. We had been a believer for a year, when, like a, right at a year when we started coming. There was a joy that was there, but I, it, there was so much baggage that I had pushed down for years that all of a sudden I had to actually acknowledge was there. And the Lord was, was putting things in my life to help me. So that's kind of where we came into the paradox. 
We're sitting at the table and you're at the whiteboard and you draw a map of Fort Worth, yeah. right, to kind of the A20 loop. Yeah. I just remember you, you know, putting markers on North Fort Worth and yeah. West Fort Worth and East Fort Worth and, and, and South Fort Worth. Yeah. I remember that moment thinking, this guy's crazy. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And now here we are and, you know, God's done it. Yeah. One thing that was really consistent from the beginning at Paradox was that we plant churches um, and we want to saturate the city for the glory and grace of Jesus. Now to be able to walk out in that in a tangible way is just really exciting. This is going to be where Redemption Hill starts meeting in, what, a month, right? Yeah, May 2nd. Uh, yeah. And what church are we at? So this is La Casa de Todos. Sure, of yep. course it is. You know, the, the vision back in, I don't know, 2013 for us, as uh, we just kind of drew, drew that up. And now here you're, you're kind of filling out that loop in South Fort Worth. Yep. You didn't even come to the Paradox to plant a church. No. You came here to chill, yep. rest, yep. go to seminary. Yep. Can you chill and rest at seminary? You can't. No, no, but we, we were going to do it. It was through uh, three different sermons that pertain to church planting. Okay. So uh, you preached one on Matthew 28, yeah. making disciples, yeah. and you said that uh, discipleship is a lifelong process that happens in the context of the local church. Yeah. I'm pretty I, sure I, I stole that. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. It's all right. Just claim yeah. it. I've stolen it from you. Yeah, it's, okay. It's, so, but man, just the idea that like, what if every neighborhood in Fort Worth had a healthy gospel center church? And we're kind of sensing this prompting from the Lord to be a part of that. South Fort Worth, man, it's... Uh, it's diverse, yeah. um, uh, lots of ethnic diversity, we're, you yeah. know, we're standing in it, yeah. and uh, just lots of opportunity for healthy church planting. Yeah. yeah, it was really difficult to start those conversations. After a year of studying Genesis with BSF, the Lord was just like very, very clear through Abraham's story, like this is where I'm calling you, move your tent, settle, and plant a church, build an altar, worship me. Yeah. Um, and. So we said yes. <laughs> over and over, over the last 10 years, there's been challenges and things that the Lord has done that have been just extremely difficult and humbling. But those are very, very clearly the times where the Lord has grown and sanctified me the most. But I think just thinking about what the Lord's done through the paradox, just being faithful to plant churches in the relational dynamic that we've been able to experience from being here for 10 years. And then now we get to be a part of it in South Fort Worth. It's just super exciting. There's no reason that the Lord should have done all of this with us. No, despite it really deserving to fall apart on so many levels, yeah. like God just upheld it and, yeah. and just kept doing things, yeah. you That's know? Awesome. Our desire is that every single person in this area meet Jesus. Yeah. Uh, and we think the most effective way to do that is church planting. Yeah. It's not gonna be the building of just one location, yeah. you know, but we wanna uh, train and equip and send, and we want that to be embedded in our DNA from the beginning. Redemption Hill Junior? Yeah, of course. Redemption Hill III? We've, we've, we've talked about the size of the next church planting resident for me. <laughs> he's, gonna, he's gotta be shorter? Exceptionally small. He's gonna be a really <laughs> small man. Well, uh, is that the precedent we set? I had to stand on a platform when you and I did our first video, yes. That <laughs> That's really funny. That's funny. I just love that story. I love the story of what God has done uh, these past 10 years with uh, the Allens and McCorkles and the last few years with Brad and, and his wife, Sydney. I, I'm just overjoyed at all of it. But here, here's my, here's, here's how I want to close up our time. What's next for you? What, what's your next step? Uh, nothing's going to stop Jesus' church. Hell can't stop it. A pandemic can't stop it. Stop it. Persecution can't stop it. Right? The judge of death can't stop the church in Iran. Uh, it, the, it, it's a closed country. Christianity is illegal. The church is underground. They don't have children's ministries or live streams there. They just have the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and it's multiplying like crazy. Nothing can stop Jesus' church. Right? He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me, but he's invited you in. He's invited you in. Jesus is inviting you to come play, so will you play? What's your next step? What does it look like for you? You know, it's interesting, you know, the American church way is to kind of just bounce from church to church to church and whatever city you're in, uh, but never really engaging anywhere. 
right? Bounce from live stream to live stream to live stream, but never really plugging in anywhere. And yet anywhere that you would go, anywhere that you would watch, I mean, we all have the same mission. Like our, our mission statement is to saturate Fort Worth with the glory and grace of Jesus. But, but listen to these other churches, the, the churches you probably know, our friends, Watermark Church, their mission statement is to call all people to be fully devol- devoted followers of Christ. Doxology Church, love Doxology Church, creating Christ-centered people who make a difference by connecting with Christ, transforming in community and engaging our world. Or Christ Chapel, share hope, build community, live for the kingdom. It's all the same thing. Right? Call all people, Watermark says. That's, that's the mission of God. Uh, doxology, you know, to make a people who make a difference, who engage the world. Christ Chapel, to live for the kingdom. Like we're all doing the same thing. We're all trying to do the same thing. What Jesus is doing, being aggressive from the start, multiplication, on mission. So be somewhere, wherever that is, and stay there forever and and be all in, man. That's my invitation to you, is just to be all in. What does that look like for you? For some of you, it means you need to be baptized first. Baptism is that first public proclamation that that you are his and he is yours, that that, that uh, you've been saturated in grace. You are dripping with the grace of Jesus. Men, come be baptized. May 3rd, we're doing baptisms. May 3rd. Uh, Maybe for you, it's uh, leading a city group. You want to lead one of those uh, uh, you know, churches in your home. Man, let's be trained. Let's do it. Let's get after it. Uh, maybe you want to be trained in sharing your faith or you want to grow in some way in your discipleship. Uh, and there's some steps that you want to take. We all, we have all of that for you. All right, reach out to Joel about groups and uh, uh, take the Alpha course. You can pre-register now in the summer and we'll teach you how to share your faith. Jump into a women's discipleship group. Come to men's theology night. These are all just programs, their their classes, their their ways in which we can equip you to go do the work that Jesus has called you as the church to go do. Maybe you want to get involved in pushing back darkness in the city. Great. Our partnership is with the net. They've got a training May 1st on trafficking men and women volunteers. Go be a part of that. Maybe you're just broken up right now. Like you're you're broken, you're hurting, you're sick, you're paralyzed, and you just need some care. Like you need us to pray for you. You need us to meet with you. Man, would you reach out and let us do that? The, the, the church is a hospital for the sick. Let us, let, us, let us help you in that. And then you can go out and be a part of the mission of the church uh, 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 when, when, when you're able and ready. Maybe you're just supposed to underwrite all this stuff. Maybe you're meant to just, man, be generous with your money and you need to make a commitment to the desire initiative so that we can keep doing this kind of work. Whatever that is for you, man, I don't I don't know what that looks like for you personally, but I just know that it's something. And I know that I want you to be caught up in something bigger than yourself, something that is unstoppable, something that Jesus is inviting you to be a part of. Right, come be on the front lines and watch Jesus flex and do what Jesus does as he changes the world. I want you to be a part of it. Let's pray. i got to pray for my friends. I pray you would stir in our hearts and you would call us specifically to what it looks, what it looks like to, for next step for us. Maybe to become a member of this church or another church, one of the other churches we mentioned. Maybe it's to be trained, to be discipled. Maybe it's to be sent out in some way. Maybe whatever that looks like, would you call us to our next step? Would you keep going, Lord, in the Paradox Church? We thank you. Amen. Amen, guys.